We're in uh, part two of a series uh, called True Faith that we're starting through this, this summer period. And uh, really we're preaching through different parts of the Bible and specifically looking at how faith is outworked in the lives of real people. And we've taken uh, some different men and women from church history to act as something of an example of faith worked out in real life. And the title of uh, this message is, How Do I Know My Faith is Real? How do I know my faith is real? I'm going to be speaking uh, from from the Bible and also referring to a man called John Knox, and I'll explain more about him if you're unfamiliar with him uh, particularly. But how do I know my faith is real? This is a question that really is asked by people, I would say, across the, the faith spectrum. You might be here and you're kind of asking, Uh, Can faith ever be real? Is it just something that we kind of make up, convince ourselves about it? Maybe you're investigating Christianity and you're thinking that. Is faith really something that, that can be real? But it's also a question, how do I know my faith is real? That often maybe is asked by people who are relatively new to Christianity. Maybe you've made a decision to follow Christ. And you're wondering, is my faith really strong? Is it, uh, is it what it's supposed to be? And often, naturally, we can find, especially if you come into a, a church community and you look at others around you, it can be the perception that other people's faith seems much stronger than yours and maybe you have doubts and questions. Well, that is a natural place to be and it's a natural question uh, to ask. But also, this kind of question, we ask ourselves... Uh, maybe when we've been a Christian for a longer time, but maybe more commonly when things in life don't go the way that we want them to go, when we face difficulties, when we face trials, and we're thinking, there's something about it rocking our faith, maybe questioning our trust in God, uh, questioning whether God is with us and He's really uh, working in our lives when we go through uh, difficulty. And so wherever we are on that spectrum, I hope I'm speaking to you as someone who's has thought about this question and hopefully I'll have something to say that is helpful to you where you're at. Because the good news is there is an answer to this. How do I know my faith is real? Yes, you can have an answer to that. You can be convinced of it. That's the good news. The bad news is that in some respects you're not going to like the answer. Because actually the context in which um, often the genuineness of our faith is to be found is when indeed we do face difficulty in life. Because that forces us into a corner and reveals really what we are actually trusting in our lives. And what I want to say today is not just that the presence of difficulty in life kind of proves whether our faith is genuine, although that is part of it. I also want to say that actually God teaches us about this kind of season that we might go through in life and reminds us that actually in those difficult seasons, God is actually doing most work to establish and grow our faith. And so hopefully what I have to say today is uh, encouraging, even though we're looking at a topic that you know, how do we respond when times are difficult? And we're going to be looking at some examples from the life of this man, John Knox, who I'll explain more about in a minute. But we're going to look at a passage in uh, towards the end of the New Testament that really uh, is a letter by a man called Peter to some churches who are facing difficulty. They're facing trial. And he has words of encouragement to them. And if you know anything about the stories of Jesus, you'll know that Peter is someone who has been through difficulties in life. He was a close friend of Jesus, but actually at a crucial point when Jesus was taken to be crucified, Peter fails Jesus. Peter denies even knowing Jesus. And so Peter is someone who's very aware of his weakness and very aware of how not to respond when you face a moment of trial and pressure in your life. But not only did once Jesus go to the cross and was resurrected on the third day, Jesus restores his relationship to Peter. He reconciles with him. And not only is that friendship reconnected, that Jesus shows his great love in forgiving and restoring Peter, but actually gives Peter a fatherly role within the church to encourage others and lead others and shepherd others who are in their Christian faith and maybe also 
experiencing difficulty, trial, pressures, and that sort of thing. So these words that I'm about to read are not just academic kind of textbook answers to how we might go through a period of difficulty in life. They're by someone who's been there, who's even failed in that moment, but known the grace of God through it to encourage, and now wants to encourage others as well. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, starting reading at verse 3. The words will be on the screen as well. Peter writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, who by God's, gra- sorry, God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the trial and difficulty that these churches have been experiencing is one in which because of a decision to follow Christ, they are facing difficulties in society. Many of these new Christians would have lost their jobs. Many of them would have been shunned by their families because religious practices and spiritual practices in the first century were so intertwined with the fabric of society. That to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus is the only God, Jesus is the only one that deserving, is deserving of worship, would actually put them completely at odds with family, with friends, with employment. And there was a great, they were aware of their great cost in following Jesus. And Peter is encouraging them to look to what God is doing and the strengthening of their faith that they might find, even though they face trial. And actually these Words shortly after they were written, the heat was turned up even more on Christians. And actually they experienced violent persecution and even death just because they were Christians. Now in our experience, in the culture that we lived, it's unlikely that we are going to experience that level of opposition because of our Christian faith. But all of us, regardless of whether we're Christian or not, or whatever faith background we have or none, We all have to have a way of dealing with the difficult things that happen in life. A way of thinking about them, a way of emotionally responding to them. Because actually, suffering is a human experience. We live in a broken world and we experience it to one measure or another. We don't all experience it in the same way. Some experience much more than others That happens in life, but if we have lived for any length of time, we'll experience difficulty. Life doesn't always go the way that we want. And so whoever we are, we have to have a way of dealing with it, a strategy. And there are many different ways that people respond. There might be someone that we turn to, someone, a close friend, a family member that we look to for support, for advice, for wisdom about how to get through. And that's not wrong. That can be a good thing. There's wisdom, psychology in the world that, that might give us instruction about how to cope with difficult things we go through. Grief, family breakdown, financial difficulties, whatever it might be. There's physical pain. There's Huge amount of a range in terms of the suffering. And there are different wisdom that we might turn to when we find ourselves in that, those situations. Maybe we turn to ourselves and we, tr- we trust ourselves to get us through. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to sort this out myself. I'm going to maybe, maybe stoically just get through this on my own. Don't need other people's help. What happens when we face difficulty in life is it reveals what we are trusting What we are trusting to, we have to turn to someone other, either outside of ourselves or within ourselves to, in order to get us through. And it could be presented that for, well, for Christians, they have this kind of faith that, well, you know, they just kind of make it up. They believe in this God and that's what faith is. You believe something that you know is not true, but it just makes you feel better. It helps you to you know, navigate difficult situations in life and that's what Christians do. Well, that's not at all what um, faith as presented by the Bible is. 
And it's important we, when I'm talking about what it is to have faith in God through difficulty that we understand what the Bible is talking about when it uses the word faith. It could be said there are three strands to it. Faith is firstly about understanding. It's about under, we have to understand something and the Bible is God's revelation of himself and his gospel and what he has done for us. And he wants us to know him. If we are say, saying just with people that we know, oh, I have faith in him, we're, we're saying that we know something about their character, what they're like, in order to say that. And the Bible doesn't demand that we sort of say we have faith in God, knowing nothing about him. No, God is keen to reveal himself so we have an intellectual understanding of what he is like. We don't say we have faith in someone when they're a complete stranger to us. And neither does God want us to have that kind of faith in him. He wants us to know him. But it's not just about knowing. That's one strand. Faith is understanding. But faith is also trust. And when we read that word faith in the Bible, it might be better for us to interpret and replace that word with trust, because that's more what it's getting at. It's an understanding of who someone is, God in this case, but then it's making a willful decision to trust him. Based on what I know of God, I'm going to trust who he is. I'm going to trust my life to what he says is true. I'm going to trust him for forgiveness, for acceptance, for eternal life, and trust that his instruction to me about the way to live my life is good for me. It's about understanding, it's about trust, but also it is about action. It is about how we respond. And the Bible says that faith without deeds is dead. We can get confused about that, but what it's saying is if we understand who God is, if we make a decision to trust him, then what naturally flows from that is a different kind of response to life, a way that we live, the decisions that we make, what we do, what we say is different because it's connected to what we know of God and our decision to trust him. So that is what faith is according to the Bible. And so when we're talking about finding a strength of faith in God through difficulty, that is what we're talking about. It's not just believing something, believing something that we just might imagine to be true. It's pressing into what we know of God and resolving to trust him and respond differently because of what we know of him. Now, this is not something that's easy. In all that I'm saying, and I'm going to get on to talk about John Knox and the example from his life, but this is not something that is straightforward and easy. It's difficult. Pain is difficult. Suffering is difficult. And we all experience it, as I say, to one degree or another. And I'd like to suggest that we live in a time and culture that, if I can suggest, we're not particularly good at dealing with suffering. That's a very general comment, but I'm saying it as an observation, but also from my own life. Because what I've experienced in my own, own life is that we live in a time and have the privilege of the environment in which we live, that we can expect to live a relatively pain-free existence through the advances in technology, through medical science that's available to us. We can expect to have most of, if not all, you know, all, with a few exceptions, of having living life without significant pain. And because of the technology that we have, the opportunities that we have, the availability to travel and to um, have jobs and uh, different areas and do what we want to do, and the, the power that we have that technology brings, it gives us, may I say, an illusion that we can have a life that is comfortable, that is secure, and that fits and meets our needs in the way we want it to. That is an illusion that the technology that we have today has brought us into. And that is something that previous generations have not had that luxury to think that way. Because, you know, to take the example of John Knox, he lived in the 16th century. Life was physical pain for people at that stage in life. No, they didn't have the same medical situations we have, dentistry, things that we take for granted. And so the, the, people's lives were just genuinely physical pain for most of it because they didn't have anything, anyone to sort it for them. But we don't have that situation. And other people around the world would also experience different, different levels of suffering. Life is very difficult, to, uh, different to what it is for us. And so when we experience pain, 
when we experience trial and difficulty, well, it's like, this is not part of my plan for what my life is going to be like. This is somehow a completely rude interruption to the way I was making my life to be. And we don't have that frame of reference. We think we have control over our lives. But, and then when these things unexpectedly happen to us that are difficult, we don't, we, often we don't respond well because we don't, we don't ha- we're not used to it. Now, when I'm saying that, you might think, well, you know, I'm, we, we recognize that life is not going to go perfectly. But in my experience, I know th- there's a limit. There's a limit to what we have as reasonable difficulty. And it gets to a point that is, you know, that's reasonable. And beyond that, then that's really an issue and we struggle to deal with it. I know that is true in my life. And it was um, some just from being in a small group in this church and working that through and get others helping me to realize that actually what I wanted in my life, one of the main objectives was have a comfortable, um, you know, relatively pain-free life. And when it wasn't going the way I wanted, I was like, God, you know, asking, asking him to sort this out. And it didn't seem that God was answering my prayers. God, do this. And he didn't do it. And it through that frustration, helped me to realize, okay, maybe what God wants for my life is slightly different than the comfortable life that I was going after. You see, we have those kind of limits. Maybe to take an example, maybe in a situation where, you know, work is difficult. And we say, well, you know, life's not perfect. Maybe we're going to have a boss that we don't get on with. Work is difficult for a season. And we can just deal with that. It doesn't rock our faith. It doesn't cause us to spiral into despair. It's just difficult. And then maybe we lose, lose our job. That's another level of difficulty in life. And for some of us, that might be devastating. And for some of us, well, we can take that on the chin. These things happen. I'll get something else. I'll get another job. But then life pushes us beyond that reasonable limit. When we can't find another job and we're out of work for a week, two weeks, two months, six months, a year, longer. God, what are you doing? This is not the way my life should be. And we turn to other things. What do we turn to in those times? Do we turn to just discouragement? Do we turn to frustration and anger? Do we turn to other things to make us feel better? We all have a strategy when life takes us beyond where we want to go. And we need a community to help us to see what God is doing. To see what God is doing. And actually that what God wants in our life and what he wants to bring about in our life might be more significant than what we thought our life should be about. And to illustrate that, I want to um, talk about this man, John Knox. He's, as I say, lived in the uh, 16th century, which is, which is a long time, long time ago. We, last uh, summer, we did a series on the Reformation. And if you were here, the Reformation was a key uh, part, not just in church history, but in history in general. And uh, Knox was the man who led uh, the Reformation in Scotland. And uh, he was born in uh, East, East Lothian, a place called Haddington, which is incidentally just down the road from where my parents now live, which is kind of a connection why I chose him to speak on today. Uh, but he lived during, during the 16th century. Now, that's a long time ago. When, uh, just to give it some context, when John Knox died in 1572, William Shakespeare was a young lad of eight years old. And we don't normally think of Shakespeare as a kid. You know, you can imagine him sitting in an English class, learning about sonnets and getting, ironically getting really bored about it, probably. And uh, probably looking out the window, thinking about playing football instead. But that's not actually what happened, because football wasn't invented for another three centuries. <laughs> and uh, glass windows in common buildings weren't even a thing for another hundred years. So this is the kind of time that we're, we're talking about. It's a very long time ago. I think through this series, it's the longest ago that we're, we're going back into our, into our history here. But John Knox is a man that has a great uh, legacy of what he achieved in his lifetime. 
Uh, through this Reformation, broke away from the Catholic Church that had become incredibly corrupt. It was a, a, a political power. People in authority within the church that, that controlled people had much more power than the monarchy at the time, uh, were put there because of political influence rather than any sense of piety. The leaders were immoral, they were corrupt, and people began to speak out, influenced by what was happening in Europe at the time, led by Martin Luther. People began to speak out about what the Bible actually said and the truth of it and the truth of this wonderful gospel that we have in Jesus Christ, which wasn't being taught and was hidden among superstitious, super-religious practices that made the common man completely unaware of the grace of God and the the simple truth of the gospel. And... um, Knox was a man who was influenced by these early reformers. He was educated at at St. Andrew's University, and he was at at first ordained into the priesthood of the church when he he finished his studies at St. Andrew's. And he became a priest, he became a a teacher as well. And his legacy is not one that's just uh, about starting the Church of Scotland as it became a, the, the main church in Scotland as it is now. He founded that, and he also founded Presbyterianism, the denomination that we have, which may be less familiar in England, uh, but a huge denomination around the world. Probably 75 million Christians are Presbyterian, and if John Knox is the, the father of Presbyterianism. But not only did he have a legacy in the church, but he also had a legacy in education as well. He, had a, he was a man of conviction that believed that children should be educated. And we see uh, his legacy in the education system in Britain uh, right now as well. So he's an incredibly influential person, was a man who was bold in preaching the truth of the Bible for, uh, in, in the face of great opposition and danger. Because to speak out against the church at this time was uh, really to put yourself in grave danger. And as well as being, as part of the church, as well as being a teacher, he soon, after a few years, became a bodyguard to one of these early reformers, a man called George Wishart. Now, Knox was his bodyguard because actually to speak out would be, there was danger that he would be captured and put to death by, uh, burnt at the stake. And many Protestants were burnt at the stake, many of Knox's contemporaries. And Knox was known to carry with him a two-handed sword in order to protect George Wisher. Unfortunately, Knox was not particularly good, it seems, at being his bodyguard because uh, Wisher was indeed uh, captured and sentenced to be executed and was burned at the stake. Now, the person that I want to go into this sort of story because we get to the place where John Knox has great difficulty in his life. Well, he was discipled by this man, George Wishart, and George Wishart was executed on uh, orders uh, of a man called Cardinal Beaton. Now, Beaton was resided in the castle at St. Andrews. Maybe some of you have been up to St. Andrews. Well, Cardinal Beaton was in the castle, and he was an incredibly corrupt and immoral man and had ordered the execution of Wisher. And um, these Protestant reformers um, retaliated, and five men broke into St. Andrews Castle, uh, snuck in there, burst into Cardinal Beaton's uh, chambers and murdered him. And not only did they murder him, but actually they they got a band together to join them in the castle and barricaded themselves in there. There was about 150 of their friends and family who had sort of were holed up in this castle at the time in rebelling against the, the church. And Knox was not a leader at this stage. He was influenced by these guys, uh, but he was a teacher. He was teaching some of the children of the people that were in the castle. And so he was, uh, he was kind of ushered into it and found himself in this place, being in the castle at St. Andrews. And during uh, their services there, as they were teaching one another, on one occasion, the chaplain was speaking about the truth of the Bible and said, one of the things that, that God does through his church, the real church, is that he raises up leaders and raises up preachers. And as he rose to the climax of his sermon, he singled out John Knox and said, and God is calling you to be a preacher and to be a leader of this Reformation. 
And all the people, all the congregation around them said, yes, this is what God is doing. We believe it. John Knox, you're our man. And John Knox was completely overwhelmed, burst into tears and ran to his his chambers himself. Uh, But soon realized this was what God's call in his life was, to speak the truth of Jesus, to stand up to the tyrannical uh, rule of the church and change, uh, change the nation. And he did indeed go on to do that. He was a man that stood before kings and queens and told them that we're wrong. He influenced culture. He changed the the political landscape uh, of of the church as well as the the culture uh, and the nation, nation of Scotland. He went on to do it. But what happened next was that he was plunged into severe suffering. Because these guys holed up in St. Andrew's Castle, unfortunately, didn't last that long. Now, for reasons that it's going to take too long to go into, Scotland was politically aligned with, the, with France at the time. And it was French galleys that were sent round the coast in order to uh, get rid of these uh, rebels holed up in St. Andrew's Castle. And so the French galleys came. And the guys in the castle managed to hold out for quite a long time, two months But then plague broke out amongst uh, the the castle and they were forced to surrender. Now, the the leaders of this band of of men and women in the castle, uh, the leaders were taken as prisoners. The ones who were noble, ones who had uh, sort of status in society, they were just taken as prisoners. But the common people, amongst whom was Knox, were condemned to be galley slaves in these French ships. And this really was a death sentence because these were, they were taken as slaves, given the meagerest rations just to keep them alive and condemned to just row these, these huge heavy oars all day and all night, no sanitation whatsoever, just slept on the, the, the floor of, of the ship. And many of them, many of them would, have, would have died there. In that context, such was the horrific uh, conditions. And this is where Knox found himself. Now remember, Knox is someone who has just recently discovered the grace of Jesus Christ. The the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus has come to offer forgiveness, to offer life, to offer acceptance before God. And he's, in face of opposition, taken hold of this. Not only that, he's known... God really speak to him and get, give him a vision for his life to be a preacher and to share this gospel with people who have been in the church but had no idea that God was a God of love and grace. And he finds himself in a place of suffering with no end in sight. And this as Christians is often the place that we find ourselves in. We know the promises of God. We know something of the gospel of God, but our situation where we find ourselves in, what's right in front of us, just doesn't seem to match up to it. God, how can you be good when I'm here in this situation? How can you have a plan for my life when I have to endure this kind of suffering? And Knox, like we are, was backed into the corner by situation. How is he going to respond? What is he going to do about it? And it could have been the case. There was tremendous pressure on these uh, men and women to recant their their Protestant uh, views and come back to to the church. And in one uh, episode, when he was on this ship, uh, the the French Catholics were passing around this picture of a saint, I think it was. And as part of their sort of superstitious worship, they would kiss the, the, the portrait in order as an act of worship to God. So strange and, and uh, not according to what the Bible says at all. And it, it was passed to John Knox and he's on this ship and he snatches it and throws it overboard. And he, he decided not to give up on the promises of God in his life. And I believe as we look at his life and we look at what he went on to achieve, it was actually through this early period in his life that had immense suffering and difficulty, God was actually preparing him. Because when you're forced into a corner, you're forced into a situation of who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust yourself? Are you going to trust someone else? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust what you know about him? Make a decision to put your trust in him and respond out of that. 
And there's a point in which the, the Knox was, uh, got sick, as they all, all would have done on this ship, and was at a point close to death. And his friends were around him, wondering whether he was still with them. And they were sailing back and forth between France and Scotland. And his friends are saying, can you see the shore? And this is a quotation uh, from Knox himself, as he's kind of at the point of death in terms of sickness. And they said, can you see the shore? And he says, yes, I know it well. For I see the steeple of that place where God first opened my mouth to his glory. And I am fully persuaded, however weak that ever I now appear, that I shall not depart this life, till that my tongue shall glorify his godly name in that same place. Knox held on to the promises of God and what God had spoken to him in his life. And actually, I believe that what Knox knew of the gospel became a real rea- a reality in his experience because he had been taught that God was up there somewhere and by having these different religious rituals and saying these prayers a repeated amount of times, you could somehow climb the ladder to where God is. Knox had discovered the gospel that Jesus stepped down into immense suffering of the cross. And actually when Knox himself found him, Self in that place of difficulty and suffering, he found that that's where Jesus was. That's where Jesus, that's where Jesus had gone before. That Jesus is not someone that stands so far above us that we can't reach. He is someone that has stepped down into sin, down into our suffering so that we might meet him there. And as we do meet him there, a deep friendship can be established with him in a way that If life was just plain sailing, we otherwise might have missed. To have friendship with Jesus in a place of suffering is a friendship that will endure in our lives. And this is what God is doing in the lives of Christians who find themselves in a place of difficulty and suffering. He is actually strengthening their faith revealing more of the gospel to them. Now, this is not our felt experience so often. It's not our felt experience. We feel that we might be struggling to even hold on to Jesus when we are in a place of suffering. But when you manage to hold on to Jesus, you find that you'll emerge from that season with a strength that you didn't know you had. And if you can go through The depths of suffering with Jesus, you will emerge with a faith in him that is precious. Like this passage says, that just as stone is pressed and by extreme heat and pressure, out of which comes a jewel, so is our faith. God does something uniquely. And Knox knew that and he discovered that. And the cross shows us purpose in suffering. That if, G, that if God can take, the Father can take his son Jesus through the suffering to bring about our salvation and our blessing, there is also can be purpose in our suffering and in our trial, in our difficulty. You see, when we, when we suffer, when we experience pain, and this can be any level of pain, but sometimes it feels like God's putting us on the bench because we can't do the things that we used to be able to do. Suffering, it feels like it's sidelining us. But I don't believe that's what God does. He doesn't put us on the bench. He's actually taking us into the gym in order to build up strength in him, in our faith. That he is good enough to us that he wants to use this period of difficulty to make us into the people that he wants us to be. To have a deeper level of trust in him than we otherwise would have had. And that's what happened to Knox. He emerged from this period of suffering with a faith to change a nation. And when you look at Knox's life, I don't believe he would have gone on to achieve what he went on to achieve had he not had that period where he was pressed into a corner and his trust in God was cemented. Because he emerged, and one of the most famous um, quotations of John Knox was his prayer, give me Scotland or I die. He was so resolute in his, what he had felt God had called him to do, 
And it's because he endured suffering, he was able to, his faith in God was so strong that he could believe that God could give him a nation, change a whole nation. And in our lives, we have ambitions of what we want ourselves to do or God to do through us. And maybe God's leading us into a period of difficulty and trial because he wants to do a work in our hearts and in our faith that's preparing us for something that's much, much bigger. And that's a perspective that we sometimes lose. And if we can learn something from Knox, we can learn that actually it's through difficulty we can emerge with a a faith that empowers us to pray bigger prayers than we did before and trust God to a, a, a deeper level than we had done otherwise. Knox uh, is known to be a man of faith and a man of prayer. And actually, the, the Mary, Queen of Scots, is reported to have proclaimed, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. That's what she said of Knox. And when you look at, uh, on what Knox saw in his life, encountered many subsequent difficulties. He spent 19 months in the, in the French galley and did manage to escape and went on to change this nation uh, for the gospel. When you look upon his life and you look upon what he did, it's no wonder uh, monarchs would have said this of him. But I want to, before I finish, just make sure that we learn the right things. I'm not saying we're all going to be John Knox and change a nation in one sense. But what is your Scotland? What is your thing that actually God might be preparing you for? That you weren't, with maybe your ambition was much smaller than. But actually God wants to do something more wonderful in your life. That might well include times of difficulty, but it's also an adventure that's much bigger Maybe God is bringing you through a period of difficulty in life because he's preparing you to go much further in life than you thought was possible. And our ambitions, my selfish ambition of having just a comfortable, pain-free existence, and I didn't open myself up to the fact that maybe God's bringing me through difficulty and maybe God's causing me to be patient because he wants to do something much bigger in my life. And he's got bigger plans. And what adventure does God want to take you on in your life that requires a greater faith than you have now? And maybe the your trial that you're going through, you have gone through, or you will go through in the future, maybe that trial is exactly what you need to strengthen you, to strip away other comforts so that all you have is to cling to Jesus. And that strengthening of your faith in him will set you up. Let me just return to this passage again as we close. And I think about this question again. How do I know my faith is real? Well, when you turn to God as your only hope in the face of suffering, you know it's, it's genuine. Because when things are going well, we can say, oh, I follow Jesus. Actually, as we go through those periods of difficulty, so we can say, right, who are you going to decide to follow? Are you going to do this God's way? Are you going to trust in him? Are you going to turn to something else? Suffering does that like no other thing. But also, I want us to, as the, Peter is encouraging these Christians to do so, to look what God is doing. God has tremendous purpose in suffering. And just like a stone is pressure, pressure and heat is brought to it to bring about a precious jewel, so it can be with our faith. It's not an automatic process. And sinful pride sometimes causes us to resist God. And say, God, just get me out of this. Get me out of this. What are you doing, God? How can you let this happen? And maybe instead of praying, what are you doing, God? You should say, what are you doing, God? What ways can I respond to you? What evidence can I see that you are doing something in my life that is actually something that is precious, something that's valuable, something that is worth the difficulty that I'm going through right now? And I also want to speak to you if you're someone who said, well, this is all well and good, but I've, I've blown it in the past. I've had periods of difficulty and I've not benefited from it. I've not responded to it well. I've, I've, my faith has taken a real hit from that experience. Well, I want to remind you just about who the words uh, that we've been reading have been written by. Peter, 
He failed Jesus. He was closest as anyone could be to Jesus, and he failed him. But Peter was restored by the grace of God, restored by the mercy of Jesus. And that is, all of this is mercy of Jesus. The fact that Jesus wants to do a work in our lives is because of his mercy. It's not because we're worthy of it. It's because he loves us. And he loves us enough to bring us through difficulty, but bring us peace and joy that we can find within it. And not only that, but a strength and conviction and closeness to him that we couldn't have found anywhere else. And I want us to also be reminded of the eternal perspective as Peter reminds these Christians to have. Because he says, in this you rejoice, though for a little while. And some in this room have suffered for weeks, others for years, others for decades. And maybe you're even towards the end of your life and in a period of suffering and say, what purpose, what adventure might this be for if I'm suffering at the end of my life? Peter says, you've suffered for a little while. I've suffered for decades. Yeah, it's a little while in the context of eternity. And what God does in our lives is, in one sense, for this life. And he brings about faith in us and shows us his grace to us so that we can follow him in this life. But God's number one objective in our lives is not just to make us comfortable now but is to make us into the people that he wants us to be, to sit alongside him in eternity and rule and reign with him. That's more important to him, to make us fit to be alongside Jesus. And so God is doing and is committed to that work for all the days that you're on this earth. Even in old age, he's doing a work in your heart, making you more like Jesus, so you're fit to rule and reign with Christ forever. Christ went through that suffering and was exalted to the highest place. And it's him we follow. It's him, we, like him, we also will go through difficulties. But we need to remember where we're going, where we're headed. If our faith is in Christ at all, he will lead us through to sit us alongside him in eternity. And that's the main thing he is doing. Make us fit to sit alongside him. Why? Because he loves us. Because he wants us to be there with him. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much that you have sent Christ into a broken world of suffering so that we can find fellowship with him there. Lord, we are weak people. Like Peter, we have failed you. But we thank you because of your grace towards us. We can be restored. We can be picked up by you. And you are committed to work in our lives for your praise and your glory and for eternity with you. And I thank you that's our destination. I want to pray, Lord, if there are those in the room now, Lord, who are yet to cling to you for the first time, that you would even give them faith now to see their lives in the perspective of eternity and choose to trust themselves to you, knowing that even the worst that life can throw at them is worth it because of what you are doing in their life and the promise that you have given to them. Thank you, Lord, for it. In Jesus' name, amen.